Uh, welcome to the U.S. Center. I'm Ashley Allen, and I'm from the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and I'm pleased to uh, welcome you here today. Uh, today we have a, an event on short-lived climate pollutants, and we have a, a distinguished panel here to talk to you about different aspects of, of the U.S. program. Uh, also, we want to welcome our online audience. Thanks for joining us. So to get started, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce Jonathan Pershing to give opening remarks, and then I'll introduce the, the rest of the panel. So I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Jonathan Pershing, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for at the U.S. Department of Energy. For the past several years, he has been co-chair of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, a new multilateral forum focused on short-lived climate pollutants. Many at the UN negotiations know Jonathan from his past experience as Deputy Special Envoy for Climate Change and leading many of the negotiations here. And he is one of the uh, respected experts in this climate policy making field. Thanks very much, Ashley. It's, a, it's great to be here. Uh, really nice to have a chance to talk to you about an area that I think is often not given the kind of attention that it deserves. Uh, we tend to focus most of our energy on admittedly the most important of the gases, which is CO2. But an insufficient amount of attention, perhaps, is given to some of the other gases that make up a non-trivial share of the total greenhouse gas emissions globally. There's quite a lot of information, and we'll hear a bit about some of the science of what drives that. Uh, there's been a constant stream of new information around that science, and I think we'll get an update about where that's going. But the general view seems to be that you can make a difference in terms of where you end up on the climate spectrum by how much you do on these other short-lived gases. And so part of the intent here is to take action on those gases. To that end, the panel is going to be looking at a couple of different things, and you'll hear a bit about individual efforts in methane, efforts in black carbon, and efforts in the HFCs. We'll talk mostly about the U.S. domestic set of activities to get some sense of what we are doing at home. We'll talk also, however, about some of the international efforts that we've gone forward with, and you'll hear about our participation in those and ways that we're trying to shape them. And then after my brief remarks, uh, we'll hear a few comments really about the science itself from Dr. Ravi Shankara, who's from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of the U.S., and talk to you a bit about some of the science. But let me try to put a bit of context around where we're going in a fairly brief set of introductory slides so you can kind of see a bit where we are. So this particular graphic is one that's uh, put together by the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, uh, our te technical team gives you some sense of the kinds of changes that we might be expecting uh, in greenhouse gases. On the right side, that axis looks at change in temperature. And what you can see is the projected, the expected change. We don't take any actions. The kind of the business as usual case is what you get along the top. If you are to act on a variety of different gases, the very first line would be if you took some action on black carbon and on methane. That's the one below the top you can really begin to shave off where you're going. If you worked only on CO2, which you will ultimately, of course, need to do, there is no question about the urgency, the priority, the centrality of the CO2 debate, you'd be below the line of black carbon and methane, but in fact, you could go better still if you did a full suite of mitigation actions, and the yellow line below that is not just black carbon and methane, but also includes the HFCs and includes the CO2. So the objective here is not to say it's one or the other, but to say it's both. It's all of the above. You have to do all of these things. And this is an effort to look at the pieces that are not the CO2 side, but the other components. So let me talk now for just a second and give you some context in terms of where the United States stands in our own greenhouse gas emissions. This is an overview overall of U.S. emissions, and you can see for us carbon dioxide really is the lion's share. About 85% of U.S. emissions are on the CO2 side. But that means that there's a 15% delta that is not in CO2, and we can see here about the efforts that, uh, that we need to be making. We've done some already. We've brought some of those numbers down. The United States is a little bit unusual in that for the majority of countries in the world, CO2 is not quite as big a share of the total. So some of the things that we might be able to demonstrate at home programs and policies that we're trying to take in the United States may have a benefit in terms of demonstration effects, in terms of new science, in terms of understanding policies that could apply elsewhere. And they're not a trivial share of our own, and they tend to lead to other benefits, not exclusively climate change benefits. So this is the total. You can see where we are. We're down at the lowest levels since 1996. Methane, just take a quick look at that particular number. 
a little bit hard to see the trend. The yellow line doesn't show up as well as uh, it does on some other colored paper, if you're kind of looking at it. Uh, but you can see where we are. We're going down a bit. It's about uh, a reduction, give or take some, about 8% since 1990. That's from a series of different policies, different measures. We'll hear in a moment about some of those in detail. But what you can see is that there really is a trend, a change there. The methane comes from a variety of different sources. You can see in the pie chart here uh, where they are, petroleum and natural gas, enteric fermentation, which is livestock, a discussion on landfills, whole conversation, what we can do in mining, wastewater treatment. So really a variety of different sources. And these sources are not exclusively found in the US. They're found among all the nations of the world in various levels. So we've got really capacity in the US to think through some of the problems and we're working on some of the solutions. Here's the black carbon number. Get some inf interesting information and insight here. Uh, we account on our own for about 8% of global black carbon emissions. So really it's a, a significant share of the total. And at the end of the day, you can see what the mix comes from. Uh, the largest share is transportation, mobile sources. That's the orange piece of that pie chart. The second largest share is open biomass burning, and it includes, in our case, wildfires. So you see really significant pieces in those two areas. The others are quite a bit smaller, residential and domestic, electric power and industry. That's not really where US emissions of black carbon are coming from. But we do have examples in each case where we do have such emissions. And as a consequence, again, we're working on looking at how we can address that total. One of the things, of course, about black carbon in particular is that it really contributes to air quality. And we'll see a bit of that more as we go through the details of some of the presentations. And what you can see in this next slide is what some of the trends look like. We're working quite aggressively on this. The, the bar on the far left is black carbon emissions in 1990. The bar on the far right is black carbon emissions in 2010. And this is a result of policy actions and policy efforts that have been taken. And we're looking at them across the board in the power sector, in uh, stationary sources and mobile sources, as well as uh, in uh, industrial sources. So you've got this real significant effort that's driven by policy actions and policy programs. So taking a look at those three pieces. That's more of a context, kind of a setting, a framing for where we are. Our trends are moving, I think, in, in good directions. We're working on additional policies. And what I'd like now to do is start off a bit with perhaps the science and turn it to Dr. Ravi Shankara. We'll give you a framing on that context and then we'll hear individually from the other people in the US team who are working on individual parts of this program. So thanks very much, Ashley. Thank you, Jonathan. I'll give you an introduction as well. OK, so for the next 45 minutes, we'll hear from our panelists, and then we'll leave some uh, time for questions at the end. So I'm pleased to introduce to you Dr. Ravi Shankara, who is the Director of Chemical Sciences Division at NOAA and globally preeminent atmospheric scientist, er, excuse me, atmospheric chemist in Boulder, Colorado. He is also a professor at the University of Colorado and a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and is currently sitting on the Science Advisory Panel of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Thank you, Ashley. Um, thank you. Good morning. I'm going to just very briefly go through about five slides, which kind of first tell you a little bit about uh, short-lived climate pollutants from a scientific science perspective and one example each of what we at NOAA are doing with respect to ozone, methane, black carbon, and um, HFCs, okay? Uh, as Jonathan Hershey just mentioned, the big issue is CO2, sort of the 800-pound gorilla in the room, okay? But if you were to just look beyond, oops, beyond that, there's a whole host of other things that do add up to something significant. Uh, these are the short-lived climate pollutants, and their short lifetime of the order of about 10 to 20 years, or maybe less, but definitely less than that of CO2. But very importantly, they have other effects, such as health effects, effects on precipitation, and things of that nature. So in other words, in addition to uh, their effect on climate, they definitely have other beneficial things if you were to reduce their emissions. Scientifically, they also have some other very important uh, side effects and important issues. First of all, they're all chemically active in general. Unlike CO2, they actually react quite well in the atmosphere, and they're removed that way, and that's why they have other effects, such as health effects. Secondly, if you think about the contribution that Dr. Pershing showed globally of these short-lived climate pollutants, they're not very well mixed in the atmosphere. They're very localized. 
So local effects of these pollutants are very large. The climate forcing by local, uh, the local climate forcing by these agents are huge, of the order of 10, 20 watts per square meter for black carbon, for example. Okay. And that's why that even though they're very sparse in many parts of the world, they have a huge effect globally. But they also have very important regional effects. People worry about what happens in a region. To understand the regional effects, you really do need to deal with short-lived climate pollutants. And third, because they're short-lived, if you do something about it, you're going to learn a lot about how the Earth system responds. So even if you were to stop emitting CO2, it takes quite a while for the Earth to respond. If you do something with the short-lived climate pollutants, in addition to the good benefits of, for the environment, you actually learn more about the climate. So at least that's what sci gets scientific side. Uh, so what I'm going to now is to, spend, is to spend a few minutes telling you about what we at NOAA are doing. I, it's a very large amount of effort, and it's very impo it's impossible to cover all the things we do. So I'm going to just take pick four examples, one for each, black carbon, methane, tropospheric ozone, and hydrofluorocarbons. In addition to what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about what has been in my lab there's a whole host of other components of NOAA where things are done. So here we go with the four separate examples. Example number one, black carbon. One of the major sources of black carbon in certain areas is ship emissions because ships quite often use extremely dirty fuel. Okay, And so Black carbon is also a health effect. So if you're getting these ships into the ports, it makes a big difference. So what I'm going to tell you here in all the four slides is I have four things. What is the issue? What is the approach? What are the results? And what are the benefits for doing this work? So ship emissions are something significant. So we collaborated with a, com a company called MERSC. It's a very large shipping company. And then we used our NOAA aircraft these are the hurricane hunters, uh, fully loaded with chemical instruments to go and sample what comes out of the ship. The key question we wanted to answer is, if you were to use better fuel, would you actually reduce the black carbon as it is expected? So this is what we found. Actually, we can, the ship, shipping company switched fuel for us, going from a dirty fuel to a cleaner fuel. Very clearly, when you go from a dirty fuel to a clean fuel, which is shown here, you see a factor of three reduction in the emission of black carbon, and also you, you reduce other kinds of things, such as sulfate aerosols. It's better for air quality, and it's better for climate. So the point of this is, if you were to work with this private sector, you can actually figure out what are the beneficial things that you can do, and these are some things that could be quantified when doing this, these measurements. Um, this information is of use to various agencies, such as the local air quality agencies, uh, shipping lines, and also uh, the people around. The second one is about methane. It's a big issue. The problem with methane quite often is where does it come from? Where, and so the issue that we dealt with is the Ma Los Angeles area, there's an imbalance between what people think the methane emission is versus what's in the atmosphere. Okay, So here again, we used the aircraft uh, and snooped around uh, the Los Angeles area, and we measured all the different things. There's so many things that are coming out. It's hard to figure out what is what. But it turns out all these different sources have a fingerprint of the characteristics. So if you measure all the different hydrocarbons, you can figure out how much is coming from where. So when you do that, you can see it is coming from a three different regions, the missing part. There's leaks in the pipes. It's a very big part. Second, there are mobile sources, which is not as, as bad. as, And the third one is landfills and also liquid liquefied propane uh, issues, uh, the, the storage tanks, and, and dairies, cattle farms. So that's another example of how you can go ahead and figure out 
where these things are coming from. And this is something that we, one could do everywhere in the world to figure out where things are coming from. If you were to figure out it's coming from natural gas pipelines, it is in their best, in best interest to actually stop those leaks. They're essentially le throwing money uh, out the pipe, so to speak. Third example is looking at nitrogen oxides. Uh, this is, again, something that could be done everywhere else. Uh, the tropospheric ozone, there's another climate pollutant, is, comes from the combination of hydrocarbons and nitrogen oxides and sunlight. Okay. One of the key ingredient is the nitrogen oxides because that's a big part of what humans do. So this is a map of the United States and you can look at the satellite information and you can actually look at the amount of nitrogen oxide coming in the eastern U.S. versus the uh, Midwest, uh, Ohio Valley. And because of the actions taken from power plants in the U.S., you can very clearly see the reduction in nitrogen oxides. And you can then ask yourself how much it has benefited in terms of the ozone. So this is, again, something that could be done using satellite information anywhere in the world. Um, the fourth example is about HFCs. HFCs are an issue because that came about because of the Montreal Protocol. They do not destroy the ozone layer, but they are, many of them are potent greenhouse gases. The question, of course, is can we have le more benign HFCs? And that's something that we can test, and it's good to test it before you put it into use. So the kind of things you can do is laboratory studies of these compounds. We just did some for the most recently uh, proposed ones, hydrofluoroolefins, 1, 2, 3, 4, YF, and uh, 1, 2, 2, 5, YE. Don't ask me about how those num names are coming back. Okay. It's even more complicated my than my name. Um, you can do these laboratory studies and you can figure out how fast they react and what their properties are, from which you can calculate the key quantities of interest. These molecules have very short lifetimes. They have very much smaller global warming potential, maybe less than four. When they get that small, there's a question of how do you think about it? And they have ozone depletion potential of zero. So this is a good substitute for the more potent greenhouse gases. And um, th these are the kinds of things one could do to figure out before you put stuff into the atmosphere. With that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, um, should I just introduce the rest of the panel, then you guys can speak at, at, at will? Maybe a little easier that way. Okay, so the rest of our, our speakers are from the State Department. Uh, first, will speak to us is Emily McGlynn. Emily is a Senior Climate Change Advisor to the Special Envoy for Climate Change at State Department, and she works with colleagues inside and outside of the U.S. to, to promote global reductions of short-lived climate pollutants. After her, we'll have uh, John Thompson speak, who is the Deputy Director of the Office of Environmental Quality and Transboundary Issues at State Department, and he manages a wide variety of environmental issues and is a lead negotiator on the Montreal Protocol and heads an initiative focused on HFCs. Finally, we'll hear from Dave Turk, who is the S Deputy Special Envoy for Climate Change uh, at the U.S. State Department and leads U.S. engagement on international climate change initiatives and is the U.S. representative to the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. He previously served in senior positions at the White House and in Congress. Now we'll turn to Emily. Great. Okay. I'm a little shorter than everyone else. Um, okay. Let me just make sure we're at the right point. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna focus on uh, what are we doing on these issues? What is the U.S. doing domestically uh, to take action on these short-lived climate pollutants given all the important scientific foundation that we have that uh, you know scientists like Ravi Shankara have helped us to understand. Um, I'll talk about methane and black carbon policies, and then John Thompson will, will talk about the intersection between our domestic and international HFCs policy. Um, and I'm, 
I uh, want to thank our US EPA colleagues. They can't be here today, but they are a huge uh, promoter and implementer of all of these different efforts on short-lived climate pollutants, and, the, and they do an amazing job. And so um, I hope maybe even they're watching online. Um, so uh, just to start, uh, first with methane, there's, as you've seen in, in Jonathan's slides, there's a variety of sources of methane. Uh, some of the largest sources you can see here, there's well-established uh, interventions that can be taken to, to reduce these emissions. Uh, and briefly, I'll just mention that four, four of these areas, landfills, coal mine methane, oil and gas systems, and livestock are all being addressed under one of the President's new Climate Action Plan initiatives, which is an interagency methane strategy. So everything I'll talk about after this is even going to be further bol bolstered by uh, further action that will be rolled out uh, in the coming months and year. So I'll focus mostly on what are we doing uh, to reduce methane from the natural gas uh, sector in the U.S. That is the largest single source of methane in the U.S. Uh, and uh, we have uh, been able to de decrease emissions from that sector over the past uh, 20, 30 years or so by about 10 percent. Uh, we hope to do that even more because recently, just last year, U.S. EPA released uh, new source pollution standards for the natural gas sector uh, focused on volatile organic compounds, but these regulations can have strong co-benefits in terms of being able to reduce methane as well, particularly from uh, hydraulic fracturing, uh, hydraulically fractured wells. Uh, the, you can see the numbers here. There's estimated to be uh, very extensive benefits from uh, taking this policy action. Uh, not only that, but you can see uh, the cost savings are estimated to be quite large, not only directly to the industry in terms of saving their product, um, but also the health benefits and the climate benefits of reducing the methane um, is, is significant. So we're, we're very excited about the, this new policy um, and, and, and look forward to continuing the trend of reducing our methane emissions from natural gas in the U.S. Uh, in support of our regulatory framework on methane, we also have what you probably can't read because the font is too small, but that's because there's so many uh, domestic voluntary partnership programs that we have in the U.S. devoted to all the major sources of methane from agriculture to coal bed methane, landfills, even natural gas. We, ha we also have a voluntary program on that front. Um, and so these are well-established programs. They've been around for many years, and they're quite popular uh, with the industry. Um, now I'll move on to black carbon emissions. As Jonathan mentioned, you've seen this slide. The U.S. does comprise a significant portion of, of global black carbon emissions. And we also have been able to reduce those emissions over the past uh, several decades. From, mul from multiple sources, uh, with transportation as the largest source of black carbon in the U.S., uh, that's an area where, where we've been focused. Uh, you can see this, this figure is a little difficult to see, but it actually goes from 1990, this is mobile source emissions, you can see from 1990 to 2030, you see an incredible projected reduction in black carbon from, from vehicles, and quite a lot of that, that red bar you see coming from on-road diesel. Um, so that is coming through new vehicle emission standards in the heavy-duty vehicle sector. You can see we're, esti we're able to get 90% of black carbon emissions reductions from these kinds of standards, um, and they can really uh, take care of the lion's share of black carbon emissions, uh, at least uh, with, a, with a sector profile like we have in the U.S. Uh, for those uh, familiar with this kind of technology, you may know that the kind of fuel you have really depends on what kind of emissions control technology you use. You have to have low sulfur fuel to be able to use particulate control technology in your vehicles. So that's also an area where the U.S. has been strongly focused. We've um, gotten to a, a, a diesel fuel cap on our, on our, fu on our fuel of, of 15 parts per million 
uh, and for those of you who, who know what that means, it's quite low. In, in other parts of the world, you can have PPM of in the thousands uh, in their fuel. So this is quite an accomplishment in the US and enables us to really reduce emissions from our vehicles. Uh, not only that, same as with the methane measures, you see incredible uh, cost benefits from, from this kind of action, particularly on the health front. And this is one of the major arguments that we've been able to use in putting in, kind, putting in place these kinds of stringent policies. Um, there are compliance costs, but the benefits from, from health that you get from reducing these emissions, from reducing premature deaths, respiratory illness, uh, avoiding lost work days, uh, it gets into the billions of dollars per year in savings from these kinds of policies. Uh, so that's a quick overview of what we're doing on methane and black carbon, and now I'll turn it over to John to talk about our HFCs policy. Thank you. And thanks, Emily. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit today um, about um, an important policy initiative we've been pursuing for the past several years with partners in particular from Canada and Mexico to phase down uh, HFCs or hydrofluorocarbons. And the reason, just, just to explain, the reason we've been doing this is because um, there's enormous potential mitigation opportunity that can contribute meaningfully to the discussions that we're having here particularly the discussions, in fact, that I think uh, some of which are ongoing right now on the issue of ambition. Um, so th th this graph here, which comes from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, this to me sort of usefully frames this discussion. And you may not fully be able to see it, but let me give you a little description. The, the green part of the graph, that's carbon dioxide emissions. So this is all CO2 equivalent emissions. The green part gives you a sense of sort of where CO2 is in the range. The blue part of the graph is CFCs. So CFCs, highly ozone uh, depleting compounds, the production of those has now effectively been phased out under the Montreal Protocol. But you can see there, first the dark blue is the actual climate impact of CFCs, which, which was very large. And that hatched space, the, the blue crosshatch there, that shows where we were headed. Had we not had the Montreal Protocol and begun to take action, you can see how huge of an impact CFCs would have had on the climate. This is, this is a climate graph. These are climate impacts. We got rid of CFCs because they were blowing a hole in the ozone layer. But you see the climate benefits um, from that avoided future. And then what I want to emphasize here is if you, if you look at the far right there, the, the red part, the red part is HFCs. So HFCs are replacements for ozone depleting substances. And as we've gotten rid of ozone depleting substances, we've seen a rapid growth in HFCs and projecting into the future, you see quite significant growth uh, farther out. Um, projections are um, that HFCs by 2050 could amount to 7 to 19 percent of CO2 emissions. Um, that is something we would like very much to avoid is seeing a scenario like that because that growth will wipe out a lot of the other gains that we're seeing made in other areas. So to address that, um, the last several years we have come forward with a proposal with Canada and Mexico which is to use the Montreal Protocol to phase down HFCs. Um, and this graph here shows you basically what this is, is a, a, a gradual approach. Um, the reason there's two lines on this is that slowly um, over for developing, for developing countries, ab over about a 30 year time period, they would reduce uh, HFC use by 85%. For developed countries, we have moved, uh, we have proposed moving faster. So it's, it's about 20 years, so about two decades, you would gradually reduce reliance uh, on HFCs. And let me talk to you a little bit about 
why we have gone or why we have thought the Montreal Protocol is the right place to do this. Um, and the main reason, just conceptually the main reason is HFCs are predominantly substitutes for ozone depleting substances. And where they are used today and in the future aligns pretty much completely with where ozone depleting substances were, were used. It's refrigeration, it's air conditioning, solvent applications, uh, foams. It's, it's all of these sectors. Um, and the Montreal Protocol over many years has put in place a variety of institutions and mechanisms to deal specifically with intentionally produced chemicals used in those sectors. So we have things like licensing systems. Uh, we control imports, exports, and domestic production, and those are the tools that we use, and these are the tools that can be effective to get at these gases. Um, I'd also say there's um, a, a technical component the protocol has um, a technology and economic assessment panel and a science, a scientific assessment panel that work in these sectors. They work with these gases. Um, it's very natural. They've developed an enormous amount of expertise that's directly applicable to HFCs, even though the Montreal Protocol doesn't control HFCs as of now. Um, the last thing I would mention to us, a, a, a big advantage of working in the Montreal Protocol is it has an effective financial mechanism. Um, the Montreal Protocol in implementing projects and programs in uh, countries around the world uh, has already provided more than $3 billion in support to phase out ozone depleting substances. Again, um, implementing technology transition in the exact same sectors where HFCs are used. So, um, from our perspective, what we have is a big problem. We've got HFC growth. We have a mechanism that's out there and that is available and that we can use to actually solve the problem. Um, there's a number of implementation aspects of this that, that bear mentioning. From our perspective, what we're trying to create is a practical proposal, a proposal that can be implemented. That's why for developing countries, there's a 30 year time frame. All the technologies are not available today to affect this transition. But for a number of sectors, there are technologies that are available. Allowing for 30 years allows for that development, commercialization, and optimization of technology to take place. We also, note I've said phase down, not phase out. We do leave a small residual, about 15% of use of HFCs can remain. There are a number of applications where we don't today see um, an alternative. Um, so that allows countries some flexibility. And this point here I think is key. Um, a phase down allows you a lot of ways practically to achieve the goals. So you can, you can transition out of HFCs, you can go to something like um, CO2 is used as a refrigerant or ammonia uh, or hydrocarbons. So you can completely get out of the, H, the, the HFC space. In some applications, you may, you may just go to a different HFC. So some HFCs have a GWP of say 4,000, so 4,000 times more potent um, than CO2. And some options, they may be down in the hundreds. So you might be able to get an 80 or 90% reduction in global warming potential, even if you can't get fully to zero. Um, this also allows countries to focus um, very intensively on other things, uh, technology designs that maybe don't get rid of the HFC, but maybe they reduce the amount of HFC that's needed in the equipment. Uh, these are cascade types of systems, um, and you can see reductions in the amount of HFC that are needed by 90% or more in some of those designs. Um, and finally, something that I think is broadly in everyone's interest uh, the better we can make equipment and the more leak tight it is, um, the fewer emissions, the lower the amount of HFCs that ultimately you have to replace. And I, I won't go into the details, but there are some new technologies that are coming out that are really beginning to be commercially deployed. Uh, HFC 32 is one, 
It's being used now for small air conditioning systems in Japan. Uh, Ravi mentioned HFO 1234YF. That's being used in um, automotive air conditioning systems in uh, North America and in Europe. Uh, the commercial refrigeration, you see transcritical CO2 systems. There's a lot of good news here, but I, I, I would say in there are some sectors where technology transitions are, are still challenging. Other sectors, we see that you can either move now or you can move in the near future. Um, one thing that has come up here that I just wanted to mention briefly, um, some have asked, um, HFCs are not ozone depleting substances, um, so how can, you, how can you address them under the Montreal Protocol? And I think the very short version of that is that um, the Vienna Convention, um, which is the parent convention to the Montreal Protocol, calls on parties to, to uh, harmonize appropriate policies in the phase out of ozone depleting substances. Uh, so um, as we phase out CFCs and HCFCs and other ozone depleting substances, we can look at the other environmental impacts. And in fact, that's exactly what we see with HFCs. Uh, because HFCs very clearly are direct substitutes for these ozone depleting substances. Um, I mentioned before, um, it's a very large mitigation potential. We're talking about 90 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. Um, if you start talking about things that we have right now that we can do now that we could start, that have that kind of mitigation potential, we don't have a lot of these opportunities. So it seems like we should take, uh, take advantage of that. And finally on this, you know, our, our, proposal, our proposal is let's use this exist existing mechanism. We can use it to phase down production and consumption. We would leave reporting and accounting of HFCs here in this body, in the UNFCCC and the KP. They can continue as they always have. So let me just briefly mention, this is a graph from EPA. Uh, the red line, the red line is a projection of US HFC um, use into the future. Um, and the blue line there at the bottom uh, is the, uh, it, it's the step, it's the phase down proposal. And what this shows you, again, it's just a projection, but we tried to look at how would, how would the US go about implementing something like this? And it's broken down sector by sector. And that gets back to what I said. In some sectors, there's alternatives that are available and we can see a path forward. In other areas, there really are challenges. And I think what you see here, in the near term, there's significant opportunities for mitigation. We see that in mobile air conditioning, we see it in foams, we see it in all the refrigeration sectors. But if you look farther down the line, there are some more challenging spaces here, uh, like stationary air conditioning. Um, so that's, that's the thinking that we have done and that EPA in particular has done uh, to, to really kind of show what the potential is in the U.S. And then finally, um, this is uh, some data that's presented by UNEP and I, th I think the main point here is um, HFC, HFC emissions are relatively small now, but they're growing rapidly and they're growing rapidly precisely because we're getting rid of these ozone depleting substances. That's a pretty dramatic climb between 1990 and 2010. All indications are these rapid growth rates are continuing and probably accelerating into the future. Um, so um, what we would like to do is to really take a close look at this, use an effective global tool like the Montreal Protocol and see if we can head off uh, this growth to the extent possible. And in doing so, if we can do it on a global basis, achieve uh, 90 gigatons uh, of CO2 equivalent benefit through 2050. Thank you. Great, thanks, John. We really got to get a new name for that HFO 1234. Why? I'm, I'm going to pronounce. Uh, I'm going to propose Yef. Let's call it Yef. <laughs> I like that one. Okay, Dave. And everyone, be sure to get your questions ready because we'll move to the Q&A portion after this. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the international efforts the U.S. is undertaking with various partners around the world. 
and then we'll have a quiz and see who can tell the difference between HFC 32 and HFO 1234YF, or how is it pronounced, Ashley? Yes. I know there's one audience member who can answer that question. Maybe we'll, we'll see if there's others. I'll go through this quickly so we can get to some questions and answers in case anybody has um, something specific that they'd like to ask. So the U.S., um, as you might, be might, might have guessed, due to all our domestic work, John already mentioned some of the international work we do on the HFC side, we're engaged in a range of international efforts. I'm going to run through uh, a number of them. First one I'll talk about is the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. This is something that was launched two years ago. We started with six country partners. We're now up to 35 country partners. We're up to over 70 partners. And it's a new kind of coalition, if you will. It's not aimed, as this body is, of trying to reach some kind of international um, treaty or international deal. It's much more focused on real world action. What can we do together as countries, as businesses, as NGOs, as other partners like the World Bank, UNEP, the World Health Organization recently joined. What can we do together to do action? How can we support each other? How can we share knowledge? How can we um, tee up different models to really make real world reductions? And not just nibbling around the margins kinds of things, but how can we make um, significant, meaningful, um, game changing differences um, in this sector? And we're doing this for the climate benefit, as you heard about the, the climate benefit that can be achieved from short lived climate pollutant reduction but also for the health benefits, also, also for the agriculture productivity benefits. Um, these are various pictures of some of our meetings. We actually have another high-level assembly meeting of our coalition um, this afternoon, where we'll have our 34 five country partners, other, other leaders in this organization. And it's quite exciting to see the growth, and it's actually quite exciting for those of us who have been in some of these meetings to see the enthusiasm, see the um, constructive attitude that our various partners um, bring to the table. And this is developed countries, this is developing countries, this is a range of organizations, private sector, all working together. And it's a breath of fresh air um, about working together to, to do something in the real world. So the bulk of our work is done through what we call initiatives. These are the 10 initiatives that we have currently. Some are, uh, have been around for the two years of the existence of our coalition. Others, like the Agriculture Initiative, is a very new one. They all share some common features in that they're meant to be big initiatives, meant to be meaningful, trying to take big chunks of these emissions um, out on a global scale. But they're all different as well. Each sector is different, as you might imagine. Methane is different than black carbon is different than HFCs. Um, the various challenges and obstacles are different. So all of these try to come at um, each of these problems in a, 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 a different way. Some have sh common features. Um, some have some very different approaches. So what I'll, run do, what I'll do is just run through a couple of them to give you a flavor of the kinds of things we're doing in the CCAC. So one of the uh, initiatives we've got is focused on heavy-duty diesel vehicles and engines. As you uh, might have remembered from Emily's um, presentation, we've done a lot in the United States to reduce our emissions from the mobile sector, and specifically the heavy-duty diesel vehicle part of that, which is a huge chunk. Um, there are a lot of things that can reduce, not just reducing 5% or 10%, but significant chunks, orders of magnitudes of reductions. A lot of it centers around having low sulfur fuels, which then allows you to have particulate matter filters on trucks. Um, but there's also a number of other range uh, things, things that we can do. So what we're doing is working in some key countries, including some of the bigger countries around the world, to actually um, help these countries reduce the sulfur content in their fuel, which allows them to get those climate benefits, but also the health benefits from reducing that particulate matter and black carbon being the, 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 the part that we're most focused on because of its climate, um, climate impact. We also have another component in this initiative, which we're actually going to make some progress on today in the minister's meeting, called a, a green freight initiative. This is an attempt for countries to work with the private sector to improve efficiencies in the, f in the freight sector so you spend less gas, less um, emissions sitting idling but being more efficient both on the road side, the rail side, the intermodal side. You can save money and you can significantly reduce emissions um, and actually black carbon and CO2 emissions. So we're going to be issuing um, what we're going to call a call to action at the ministerial meeting today to basically put a marker out there in a big political way that we want to work with private sector, we want to work with countries around the world to take some of the um, 
experiences that we've had in the U.S. and experiences that we've had in some of the other um, countries in our coalition and expand that on a global scale. So again, a very ambitious project, um, one that doesn't cost a lot of money to implement. In fact, it will save money and it will produce significant benefits to health and climate. Another initiative that we've spent a lot of time working on is focused on the solid waste sector. It's the third largest, if you look at global methane um, emissions, anthropogenic methane emissions. Emily actually leads this initiative from the U.S. side, working with a number of coalition partners. We've got roughly 20 cities who are participating in one um, shape or another in this initiative. Um, we're working both on the ground in these cities to do some assessments of what these cities can do to further reduce their methane emissions. And we're also very consciously seeing that as examples um, and proven case studies that then can be exported to other cities and can then be taken to the national level. So you don't just get 19 cities or 20 cities, you build up within a country and you build up across the world. So again, a scale, a theory of change that really gets some significant reductions um, on a global scale. Another initiative is on, on the oil and natural gas sector, second largest if you think um, globally in terms of anthropogenic methane emissions, around 20% or so. Also significant black carbon emissions. The International Energy Agency recently pointed to the oil and gas sector and methane emissions in particular as one of the big four things you could do pre-2020 to actually keep us on track for the two degree target. So what we're doing here and what we spent a lot of time on here is working with industry to develop a comprehensive framework or architecture that companies could, um, be, could, could join and systematically do the inventories, do the low cost practices and technologies that can actually plug the leaks so there's less emissions coming from the um, oil and gas systems, especially on the upstream side, which is where we're focused. Um, saving and getting more product and also reducing emissions um, significantly. So again, a, a, a big scale, big, big impact kind of initiative. Um, we also have an initiative, and John Thompson is our leader on this initiative from the U.S. side, focused on HFCs. And this is complementary to the Montreal Protocol efforts that we are trying to push and other countries, over 100 countries are trying to push in the Montreal Protocol, working on some of the technology demonstration, trying to make um, some, again, real world progress to, to change, the, change the game on, on this one as well. Another effort we've done in the CCAC, but it has broader um, application, is to focus on um, assessment tools. One of the things that um, we're trying to do here, again focused on the real world, is give tools to policymakers and others to say, okay, we want to reduce black carbon. Well, how do we go about doing that? How much money can be saved? How much health can be um, improved if we do that? And this is a, basically an assessment calculator, if you will, that allows policymakers to input outputs that they want to get, what's it going to take, is it cost effective, no, well let's go at it this way, and to do that analysis so that you can actually have very tailored and very effective policies and to justify those policies in terms of the economic benefits, the health savings, etc. This is um, a slide of what that tool looks like and some of the uh, information that can be provided through that tool. The CCAC is not the only international effort the United States is involved in. There are several others um, that we're involved in with short-lived climate pollutants. Um, one that's been around since 2004, so um, 10 years, Global Methane Initiative. We've got now 42 countries, and if you see the little star at the bottom, we've now got a 43rd country. Saudi Arabia is in the process of joining the, the, the GMI, as it's called. Um, and this is an effort to work voluntarily with countries and with actors within those countries to take real world uh, pragmatic um, come as you can um, reductions um, in, in this sector. There's five different areas within the uh, methane space that GMI works, oil and gas systems, coal mines, municipal solid waste, um, agriculture waste and wastewater. Um, and then wastewater just by itself and not in the agriculture context. Number of um, bits of information about the GMI here. The thing I'd like to stress is through this experience, this is run um, jointly with state and uh, our environmental protection agency. What's been developed is um, an incredible amount of knowledge and human resource expertise in methane reductions that is a foundational um, part of the equation for CCAC for everything else in this space 
anytime anyone has a question on methane and what could be done, they go to the GMI folks. And it's, it, if you think about it in that foundational context, I think it's one of the most valuable resources, frankly, for the world in terms of methane, uh, methane emission reduction opportunities. Another effort we're involved in, a number of other countries are involved in, this is the uh, um, Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves. Incredible amounts of um, benefits that can be had here, especially on the health side, also climate benefits as well. If you see the third sub-bullet on the first bullet, exposure to cook stove smoke is the world's fourth worst health risk. Huge health risk and lots of real world um, opportunity to make improvements. The U.S. has put a big financial commitment in of $125 million over five years. A number of other countries are very focused on this as well. This is our Smartway Green Freight Program. This is what we're trying to expand through the CCAC to be a global program. Um, we've got a new Arctic Council Task Force on Black Carbon and Methane that the U.S. is a part of as an Arctic Council member. Russia, Sweden, and Canada, and a number of other, uh, all the other Arctic states are part of this task force. It just got started. We had our first meeting. We're having our second meeting in December. Um, and a couple other um, initiatives as well. One of those great acronyms, LURTAP, <laughs> which I love. Um, and there's a number of other bilateral international things as well. But why don't I stop there and um, then we'll just open it up for questions. Sounds great. Thank you. Let's uh, give a hand to our panelists. Thank you. Okay, and for those of you online, if you'd like to ask a question, just uh, tweet hashtag Ask US Center. Thank you. Why don't we start here? Yes, Axel Michaelova from Perspectives. I have a question to John regarding the bilateral HSC initiative with China. Would it be possible to elaborate uh, what action you're undertaking to eliminate HFC 23 emissions from those plants that have not been covered under the CDM and uh, what the timeline of phasing in these reductions would be? Thank you, and we only have five minutes, so I'll take one question together if you don't mind. Okay, is there another question out here? Yeah. Yes, thank you. I'm Albert Magalin from the Philippines. And uh, and uh, we would like to uh, to know uh, to inform you that uh, we have uh, expressed our support in principle to stick to zero ozone depleting potential and low uh, GWP alternatives to ozone depleting substances. My concern is about uh, since we uh, know that uh, uh, HFCs are not ODS, probably this question is uh, addressed to John. Uh, HFCs are not ODS, then the Montreal Protocol parties should now be trained to speak in terms of greenhouse gas reduction and CO2 equivalent rather than ODP in tons reduction. So it means that uh, there should be a, an interfacing between the two protocols, uh, the Montreal and the KP, uh, so as to make uh, this gas to make a, um, Montreal Protocol handle this gas production and consumption, so particularly the HFCs. So what arrangement would you think would, could be worked out to facilitate this interfacing or probably conversation between uh, among parties of these two protocols? Thank you. Well, thank, thank you both for those questions. Um, let me start with the, the first question. We have been having some good discussions with our colleagues from, from many different countries, honestly. Um, in particular, we have had some discussions with China. Um, those discussions, uh, I think specifically with respect to your question, I think most of our discussions have focused on the broader issue of phasing down production and consumption of HFCs. Um, and I think you can see the results of those in some of the recent statements. Um, uh, from President Obama and President Xi. I think the specific question that you're asking about, just, just to be honest, has not so much been uh, a particular focus. Um, obviously, China and other countries have worked through the CDM uh, in various crediting schemes to address HFC 23 emissions. Um, we have had some lower level discussions, certainly with Chinese about that, but uh, just, to, just to say, I think the real focus of those discussions is on um, the broader question of an HFC phase down, and, and from our perspective in particular on 
can we achieve some real mitigation potential here? 90 gigatons of CO2 equivalent through 2050 is, is a real contribution uh, to what we're trying to do here more broadly while recognizing, I think, as others did, we, we can't forget about CO2 or these other important climate uh, forcers as well, but this could be one significant contribution um, uh, in that context. Um, on the second question, I think in terms of um, the interface between um, ozone and climate, really, or the Montreal Protocol and the UNFCCC, um, from our perspective, and I, I think from others, this has been raised, it, it, it is a key issue. Um, we have tried to articulate very clearly, I think, and precisely how we think this works between the two bodies. And in fact, the amendment that we proposed with Canada and Mexico, it includes specific provisions that lays that out. So our, our idea is that the Montreal Protocol handles production and consumption and progressively phases those down. While at the same time, we make it very clear that the obligations that countries have undertaken in the UNFCCC and the KP remain unchanged. I think in terms of the dialogue between uh, the two different bodies, um, we have tried to foster that in a number of ways. Um, we have tried to foster that, frankly, in both bodies. Um, at the last several Montreal Protocol meetings, we've had discussion groups that have taken up this full range of issues. And I think they range from really sort of very technical, practical things of what are the alternatives that you see in different sectors, but they've talked specifically about this interface. How do we want to handle these between the two bodies? Um, and you know, from our perspective, the Montreal Protocol part of that really is contributing to the broader effort here. That's sort of where the mitigation sits. Um, the broader accounting and reporting remains here. Um, I think you're also seeing, if you listen to the discussion um, in the ADP sessions, uh, certainly last week, um, and I know we're, we're missing it right now <laughs> as we sit in here, but I've actually heard from my colleagues just before, just before I came here, there are countries that, that are raising this and are talking about this. We as countries coordinate across these bodies. So th there's not sort of a US national position in the Montreal Protocol and then when we come here, there's some sort of totally different thing. It, it, it really needs to be coordinated across both of those bodies. I think for some countries, there probably are challenges there, but I, th I think for us, we're open. We want that dialogue. You need that dialogue in both fora. We need those discussions in the Montreal Protocol. We're seeing the beginnings of those discussions there. Maybe not as much discussion as we would like, but that's beginning to happen. And I think you're seeing the beginnings of some of those discussions here uh, from some countries who are interested, who are raising this, supporting this, some raising questions, asking for explanations about how it would work. And particularly, we've, we've heard those questions here. H how do you divide this work? What do you put in the Montreal Protocol? What, what, do you, what, what, does, what does this body continue to do? And I, I think that is a critical thing that we need to work on. Um, first and foremost, though, con countries do that at the national level to ensure that it's a consistent dialogue taking place. Thank you. We have time for, if I can take just two more, and, and then we'll give our panelists a chance for some closing remarks. Do I have two more questions in the audience? Or last chance for our online audience to ask as well. Okay, you've, you've been uh, thorough and clear. So uh, any closing <coughs> remarks before we finish up? I might just say one last thing. Um, you know, the real advantage that we see um, through this Montreal Protocol approach is that it sends a signal to the market. This is a tool that will send a clear signal to the market that we want climate-friendly alternatives. That's when the private sector will invest. That's when the private sector will optimize these systems. Um, until we send that signal, um, the, m the easiest and the most comfortable technology path forward, unfortunately, will be to use some of these high GWP HFCs. So that's really what we're trying to do is to really harness innovation and the private sector and investment to try to find a better path forward on um, uh, towards climate friendly alternatives. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, finally to our panelists. Emily, did you, are you? Just wanted to okay. say thank you. Thanks to everybody. And we are try to be very open and transparent with these initiatives and we'd love to work with 
everyone in the audience and online who's watching on, on all of these different issues. And so please uh, feel free to come talk to us. And, and we look forward to working with you. Perfect. A uh, final round of applause for our panelists, please. Thank you. Great. And thanks to all of you for coming and joining us uh, in this public diplomacy space here at the U.S. Center in our one of our final days. Uh, we hope to see you later today. Uh, we've got a NASA hyperwall presentation coming up. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Okay. And at 1.30, we have a low emission development strategies event. So hope to see you at 1.30.